Hello, my name's Philip Dawson and I'd like to talk with you about three tools for minimalist scholarship of learning and teaching. So what are three things that we can do to be scholarly about our teaching and get results, but in a minimalist, efficient sort of way? Well, firstly, the scholarship of teaching and learning, which is our topic. Sotl is scholarly inquiry into student learning which advances the practice of teachings by making research findings public. This is what the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning says. Uh, SOTL is a frustrating acronym because everyone says scholarship of learning and teaching when they're referring to SOTL. It's this idea that by putting learning before teaching in the acronym we put learning before teaching. One of those things. Anyway, this is Isotl's idea. We also have another definition. The aim of scholarly teaching is also simple. It is to make transparent how we have made learning possible. For this to happen, university teachers must be informed of the theoretical perspectives and literature of teaching and learning in their discipline. And be able to collect and present rigorous evidence of their effectiveness from these perspectives as teachers. In turn, this involves reflection, inquiry, evaluation, documentation and communication. And this is Trigwell's uh, definition, Trigwell et al. This idea of scholarly teaching being about making it clear how learning's happened, being somewhat rigorous theoretical informed by the literature and be able to collect and present evidence of how learning and teaching has happened. It's this sort of definition I'd like us to run with now. So what are three things that can help us be scholarly teachers? I'm going to say reflection, feedback and review studies. Now I've chosen these three because they get results and you can do them quickly, efficiently, and throughout your life as a teacher. For reflective practice, I've chosen Rolf's model here. Uh, I've got a link up to this same model being discussed on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an efficient way to find out about things. Not the authoritative source on reflective practice. Uh, we'll look at that at a later date. But we have this idea in Rolf's model that reflective practice starts off with what? What's happened? What am I reflecting about? So an instance is that my students are talking about the assignments being unclear about what, what they have to do. The so what? The next step? Well, what does this mean? Well, I actually think this feedback from my students that the assignments are unclear might mean that yeah, the assignments are clear. I might go and do some investigation to find out, um, well, so what do, what do other people do to make assignments clear? And then now what? Well, what am I going to do about this? I might make a better rubric. I might give a template. I might have a better description. And it's this sort of basic reflective practice model that I like. Uh, there are much more sophisticated and deeper models of reflective practice out there in the literature. But I'm not convinced that they really give us a lot else. I actually think reflective practice is just part of being a professional. I would even go as far as saying that it's just part of being a human being. We see stuff happen, we think about what's happening, and then we might do something different next time. It's banal, it's boring, it's not something I feel the need to theorise about. But within the context of universities, there is much research that shows that reflective practice leads to better learning. So this is great. Our students will learn better if we are reflective practitioners. Awesome. Oh dear. There are many considerations that will have to be dealt with by the sector before it's useful will be universally accepted. The main consideration, probably more than anything else, is the demotivated staff. We're not motivated to do reflective practice because of lack of resources, lack of recognition and overwork. Reflective practice is another thing to get you to do and if you lack resources to support you in being a reflective practitioner 
if no one's going to recognize your reflective practice, you'll, you'll do it, but your supervisor won't say, good job, here's that extra increment, here's that promotion. And you're overworked anyway. There's not time to do reflective practice. So for these sorts of reasons, uh, Davis found that, yeah, reflective practice would be great, but it's, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen easily, at least. It's an additional burden on academics and invariably an additional burden on universities that choose to implement it. And I guess the other thing is that it's a really hard thing to tell if people are doing. Uh, creating a forced reflective practice assignment that evokes a genuine and uninhibited response is nearly impossible. Um, I was telling a tale to a colleague recently about a reflective practice part of an assignment I once had to do. Uh, I studied drama at school and you were required to develop your pieces through some sort of reflective practice. Everybody knew that we were just faking it the night before. And I believe the title of this article here is actually Faking It or Hating It. And it talks about the problems with creating forced reflective practice assignments. And for that reason, I try and steer clear of requiring my students to demonstrate reflective practice in some sort of formal, frilly way. If they can show it, this is fantastic but I'd prefer to not require people to show reflective practice because they'll fake it or they'll hate it, or both. Feedback is the next part of our quick scholarship of learning and teaching toolbox. Simple, informal questions asked to students. What are the best things about this unit? How might the unit be improved? Now, Monash has this I set you questionnaire, which is the informal student evaluation of teaching and units questionnaire. I recommend you find that, I've got a link up on the Moodle, and look at it and see, is this something I'd like to consider administering to my students? It's a useful, quick tool you can use to get answers to those questions and others, because sometimes people have something in their mind, they want to tell you, this is really great, this sucks. I wish you would do this thing differently. And if you don't give them that opportunity, you might never know. Or you might know, but only once it's too late and they've written that in a formal evaluation at the end of the course when you can't do anything about it to help them. So I like to stress to students that formal end of semester SETU is too late. If you tell me something in the SETU at the end of semester, I can't make things better for you. So I try to encourage feedback. Keep feedback going and accept it in as many forms as possible. Email, foam, phone that was, uh, a web form. You can set something up on Google Docs to get feedback. Moodle has anonymous feedback tools. Get them to pass it to you through the tutors. Get your tutors to give you feedback. Get peer feedback. Get a colleague to come and look and help you. With feedback, it's also important to tell people what your sphere of influence is, what you can actually change. If the students tell you, I have to write too many words for this unit, well, you mightn't be able to change that. You might have rules in your faculty that say that this unit has to have these assessment tasks and they have to be this many words. If the students tell you the timetable sucks, you can say, well, I will pass this on, but it's actually not me who does this. So trying to set up those expectations that you're not going to be able to action every feedback item that you get, but you'll do your best to do what you can within what you can control. And there's also stuff you can do to game things like set you to get better results. Now, one tip I'll give you now is to use the language of the survey in your teaching. Students are asked questions at Monash at the end of semester about if the unit helped them meet the learning objectives, if they found it intellectually stimulating, if the learning resources helped them, and if the feedback was helpful. Now, do your students know what the learning objectives are of the unit? How are they going to make an informed comment on that if they don't? If you haven't pointed out these are the learning objectives for this unit. They mightn't have thought that what you're doing is intellectually stimulating. You might be able to work in about this being a particularly interesting part of the unit. 
this being the part that really makes you think, this being the particularly stimulating part, sometimes they don't know what the learning resources are. Is that the list of readings? Is that the Moodle site? What are the learning resources? And feedback, most of all, feedback is not just written comments on an essay. Feedback is a discussion during class about how a student is tracking. Feedback is marks on a rubric. Feedback is talking with the whole class about how they as a group are tracking. And when you give people that sort of feedback, be sure to use the word feedback. Tell them I am giving you feedback now. And your feedback score on that set you might just rise a bit. So think about using the language so people know what question they're answering at the end. Feedback is reasonably consistently my highest score on SETU items. I once marked a thousand assignments in a semester and the best SETU score that I got was on feedback. This clearly wasn't from some detailed written comments. It's not possible for a thousand assignments. This was through other ways I was telling them this is feedback. Okay, the third item in our toolbox for minimalist scholarship of learning and teaching is review studies. Why review studies? Well, they systematically or intelligently collect the research on a question or topic. If I have a question, I'm better off finding someone else who's already done that, who's already collated the research together. They critique it, they balance it, they weight it. They undertake some judgment. I am transferring some of my academic judgment over to them, but we do this often in scholarship, don't we? We trust what other people have published. And they synthesize and they recommend. So they pull together the research on a topic, analyze it, see if it's any good, see what the most important bits are, see how this study cancels out this study. And then they might recommend that we do something differently. Most importantly, I want you to know review studies are not an education thing. There's nothing special about education review studies. Your discipline probably has a journal or whole journals dedicated to review studies. If you search review of X, where X is your topic, you'll probably find that that journal exists. So, Review studies are something that we use in education to get a quick understanding of a field because educational practitioners are often really, really busy and want that one study that pulls together evidence on a topic. We have a few key types of review study here. I've pulled out three. You can cut them up however you want, but this is how I see review studies. We have an idea of a narrative or a critical review or sometimes even just a literature review, like what you would have in your PhD. These reviews tend to be conducted by someone with some expertise. They collect research on a topic, they critique it and synthesize it. They choose which studies to include because they, they know stuff. They're not going to include that minor study with a tiny sample size or unrigorous methodology or unimportant findings. So that sort of review study is often fairly influenced by the person conducting the review, whereas a systematic review is a highly structured and meth methodical search, inclusion and synthesis process. In a systematic review, typically they come up with a bunch of search terms, a bunch of databases, get every article that matches that, and then have a formal process of including this study and not including that study. Lots of audit trails, lots of tracking of what their process was, and then formal methods to synthesize things. The idea being that if you and I were to both conduct a systematic review of a topic, we'd come up with similar results if we used that similar approach. Now, meta-analysis takes things another step further and combines usually quantitative studies. So if we have 10 quantitative studies, Let's pool the results together using that, some sort of clever methods to find out what the effect of this up approach or idea was across a huge sample size, across 
many studies that each have their own biases but are sort of all cancelled out by each other. Now, I'm not going to say that any one of these is better than any of the others. Um, that depends on well, a lot of things, the, the context, what exactly we're looking at, what sort of research there is out there. Uh, people who are into a thing called evidence-based practice in education would say that a meta-analysis is the best of these. Typically, a systematic review or meta-analysis lets us understand a topic or idea and know that someone has done the homework and explored that whole field. They've left no stone unturned. They've really looked for every paper. Whereas a narrative or critical review, typically we place some more faith in the judgment of the expert reviewer that they've done the right thing and they have read all of the key studies. They haven't accidentally missed something. So these are some key types of review studies. So how have review studies influenced my teaching? Well, here's three review studies that I can show you have changed the way that I teach. There's Bennett et al's critical review of evidence on digital natives. Uh, you might have heard the term digital native thrown around, hopefully in a somewhat critical sense. Uh, it's this idea that students these days are different. They're all on their Facebooks and their Twitters and Pinterests and MySpaces or whatever, and we should teach them differently because they're jacked into their computers all day, etc. It's that sort of argument. Uh, Bennett et al. found it was actually a more nuanced idea. So they conducted a critical review of the evidence and found that, well, although some of these ideas might be true, that we shouldn't assume that because they're on their Facebook, etc., that they're going to be great with technology in general, because they're not. So this critical review influenced my teaching by making me assume less of what students can do with technology. Russell's meta-analysis of media comparison studies looked at a huge number of studies that compare radio to face-to-face, -to -face, TV to face-to-face, -to -face, online to face-to-face, -to -face a whole bunch of different approaches to how we can deliver education to look at do educational outcomes change if all we change is the media. And they found that changing the mode of delivery doesn't improve learning. So this YouTube video lecture is not necessarily going to have better learning from you than if I were to be talking at you and telling you the same things. However, if we change instructional design, if we change the learning outcomes, etc., that yes, that might impact on learning. So this impacted on me by telling me not to get excited about new technologies unless it was going to change the way that I teach. If I deliver the same thing through another technology, I can expect no significant difference in learning outcomes. And finally, and I say finally, there's many review studies that influence me, but these are just three. Hat Hattie et al.'s review of learning skills interventions um, add on sort of workshops that will teach you to write an essay or whatever found that generic academic skills workshops don't really work that well. If you want to teach essay writing, if you want to teach problem solving, you are better off to teach it embedded within a unit, embedded within a discipline or context. If I try and run a how to write an essay workshop for the whole university, I shouldn't expect fantastic results from that. There was one exception though in that study, um, mnemonics. So little rhymes or little acronyms or ways that people remember things. Uh, anatomy students use them a lot to remember all the bones in the body or whatever, you know, the knee bones collected to the whatever bone, that sort of thing. Those sort of approaches do work generically. You learn how to do those well, you can apply it elsewhere. But apart from that, generic academic skills workshops don't work that well. So this is three studies that have influenced my teaching in a really efficient way. It didn't take me more than maybe an hour and a bit to read any of those studies and find ways that I can improve my teaching in an evidence-based way. So here are some tips for reading a review study in education. Firstly, find a study that you understand, even that you agree with. If you think all quantitative research is rubbish, don't go and read a meta-analysis because 
you're not going to really believe its findings. That said, if you sit on the flip side, don't go and read a critical review of qualitative research in an area. So find something you understand and agree with. Think about the participants, the context, the outcomes. So if you read a meta-analysis on the use of uh, whiteboards in education, but it's all about school children, well, that's not very applicable to higher ed necessarily. Think about what the headline findings are. So what are the big findings? What do the authors tout? Those are probably the most important things, the ones for which there was the most evidence. It might be worth focusing on those. And critique it. Don't believe everything you read is something we always say, but with review studies, it is important that you look at, well, did they include all of the research? Were they rigorous with it? I'll just jump back to the second dot point there about outcomes. Think about what sort of outcomes were they testing for? Um, sometimes the quantitative research can really focus on student performance in a multiple choice test, for instance. And if you're wanting to look at student ability in a graphic design studio, those sort of outcomes are very, very different. So when you read a review study, maybe work through those sort of dot points, maybe work with a template for note-taking or something and try and find ways you can apply it to your teaching. I hope you'll find, like I have, that it's one of the most efficient ways to improve learning and teaching. The role of review studies in the scholarship of learning and teaching is that they bring together what we know about a topic. They can sometimes tell us when we know enough about a topic as well, we should go on and pursue different things. They make research accessible and efficient there are meta-analyses that look at a thousand randomised control trial studies. Uh, you are much better to read the meta-analysis than the thousand studies. Reading the thousand studies or hundred studies or whatever is quite costly. There was an estimate done that a systematic review costs around £50,000 to produce. You and I don't have the time for things we are concerned with in our teaching to spend £50,000 worth of time on trying to investigate those ideas. It's just not worth it. Someone else already has and we should consider what they've done. They provide a starting point for reading as well. They're not the end. So start with a review study, read it, and it might give you prompts or important other things to follow up. They guide future research and policy. In my ideal world, government policy, educational policy is informed by review studies. They also get epic citations, so if citations matter to you, start writing review studies. They're the ones that get the hundreds of citations. So these are our three tools for minimalist scholarship of teaching and learning. Reflection, what happened, so what does that mean, now what do I do? Feedback, finding out what students are doing finding out what they think about it, finding out what they want us to do more of and less of, and do they understand this? And review studies. What has the broad scholarship of teaching and learning community come up with that can help me? When we're thinking about these, we've got to go back to what are the students doing? Because learning is what the student does. So when we read review studies, how can these inform what we might get students to do? Thanks a lot.